Hey everybody, I'm Suzanne Barrett Justice, and if you came to watch a painting video and a little bit of a tutorial, then you came to the right place. So in today's video, we're gonna do this, this piece right here, and we're gonna concentrate a little bit on this as far as this landscape goes, the lighting. You know, we're gonna keep our soft edges, and we're gonna go ahead and put a cat in the picture. So sit back, let's have fun, and if you want, you can paint along. And uh, yeah, here we go. Thanks again for joining me, and if you are my subscribers, of course, as always, thank you so very, very much. And if you're not, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into this piece. So I'm doing just a really light grounding to my canvas. And I'm using a color um, from Richardson's Oils, which is an olive green. And I'm going to use a lot of that particular paint color throughout this whole painting. And I'm right on the wet uh, wash of paint. I'm using vine charcoal just to lay in the dark and light values and work on the composition and, you know, switch up the areas um, that I want to change. And obviously here's where I'm just kind of sketching in my mountain lion. And I know that I want to have this kind of, the composition to kind of be oh, a little bit of a curving um, kind of motion to the piece. So I'm having to lay in the cat the way that I think uh, will be best for the composition overall. Now with the same uh, Richardson uh, olive green paint, I'm, I'm using a stronger, not quite laying in a lot of color, but I'm firming up, if you will, the composition that I did in the vine charcoal. And I'm just using a, it's actually one of the smaller um, um, ivory filberts from Rosemary that I'm using. I believe it's like a maybe a three. And I'm just, again sketching i'm sketching with the paint so i'm putting in the darker values and what's wonderful when you're using vine charcoal is that it will kind of blend in with the paint nicely and that it does enhance your darker values so you can see that the sketch that i put in was very simple i mean with the vine charcoal so i'm kind of firming up the idea with the paint now and i'm starting to do the rock structures and everything still using the same one color that i started with which is this olive green
as I lay in the sky, I am uh, using kind of a gray blue color that I mixed using primarily uh, cobalt blue and um, burnt sienna to create the gray, of course, using titanium white as well. And I'm using that color, that gray color, just to put in the cloud mass, the base for the cloud mass. And at the top of the sky, I use more of a cobalt blue and towards the horizon line, I switch to a combination of cobalt and cerulean blue. And I'm just kind of, you know, painting right up to where I did the cloud base. And you can see I've switched to a more of a cerulean and white blue there and I'm hitting the sides of my canvas at the same time. So you can see my reference there uh, to the to the left or excuse me to the right and I'm just you know you can still kind of feel that um, the olive green that's in the background that I used as the wash and it's blending nicely with the paint. Keep in mind everything's being done in the same day at this point. I have so I am working wet on wet and uh, I'm using my larger ivory Filbert and I believe it's number 12 and it's great for large surfaces and getting it in there so the sky is fun for me I'm having a lot of fun in the sky so I I've got that dark kind of dark gray down and I'm getting ready as soon as I'm not sure where I disappeared to in, in this picture and I didn't cut it out sorry about that but I am actually going to start loading up my paint and put um, the lighter values on top. Um, so yeah, it's going to happen here in just a second. Darkening the very top of the sky again, using a combination of cobalt blue and a little bit of raw umber into the paint. And that's helping to deepen the, uh, the top part of the sky because we know that the blue of sky is usually like a gradient as you the higher up in the sky you look the more intense the blue and closer to the horizon line it lightens up so now I'm just kind of softly blending the edges with a, a very soft brush I'm using an eclipse here and I'm putting in more clouds and just the soft wispy stuff and uh, yeah this is fun I'm, I'm actually really digging the sky at this point I'm having a ball putting it in and there we go putting some more clouds in and I'll start to stack up the paint and by stacking I mean putting layers of paint so you'll see as I get into the larger cloud mass that um, I can go ahead and be a little um, more uh, impasto with the actual titanium white part of it will blend into the already existing wet paint and that's kind of the beautiful thing of working wet and wet here and so I'm just slowly building up a little bit more of the white and you can see it's it's starting to get more voluminous. Is that a word? If it's not, I just made it up and you can use it too. But yeah, I'm just increasing the volume of the clouds by adding a little bit more titanium white to the mix here and creating the form that exists in the, in the actual clouds.
Now here you see the palette and I'm getting ready to actually lay some green down and you can see there's quite a bit of green. I have an ivory black. I have the Richardson's um, olive green. I have the Celadon by Charvin. My sap green in front there is actually from Windsor Newton. I have the yellow ochre. I have, oh, what is that? Brown matter. I have raw umber and I have burnt umber and I believe that is uh, unbleached titanium. And I am mixing several different greens and I'm creating different values of each one. So if I need a dark one, a dark kind of, you see I'm using a lot of this olive green. It really is doing the trick and I may be even adding a little blue to it here. And if I need to, you know, so I'm, I'm making a large volume of this because I will be using quite a bit of this paint. And uh, here we go. So we're gonna start to lay some of this paint in and I learned so much about the saguaro cactuses. And you know, of course, living in East Tennessee, we don't get a whole, <laughs> get to see a lot of those. And I understand that when you see them, they, like this, they're very, very old when they have their arms. I mean, over a hundred years old and they are protected. Uh, in uh, Arizona, so I thought that was pretty fascinating as well. I just I couldn't help but stare at these things. They were amazing. But yes, I am using that olive green mixture you saw me mixing, and I'm just kind of laying it in. I'm using a soft brush here just to keep it soft. Actually, it's a 278 series. It's a little bit old <laughs> and frayed, and it, it's wonderful for blending. And then I come in here with a dagger brush, and I'm adding some of the detail of the branches and uh, of this bush that's in front of the saguaro cactus. And so, yes, again, you know how I love my daggers and sword brushes. And this one, I believe, is a 3 8 uh, dagger, uh, of course, by Rosemary. And it's an, it's an ivory dagger. And I'm laying this in, but I have to keep reminding myself not to get too crazy with the detail in the background because, yes, this whole mass here, this this big cactus and this bush are kind of in the background, so I can't get too nuts here with the details. So once I feel like the branches are a little bit too uh, prominent, too twiggy, I'll come back in and soften them up, and that's what you see me doing here. And I'm using the 278 series. It's a natural hair brush, super, super soft, just with a little, you can see I use a little bit of, uh, of the linseed oil. That helps keep things um, from dragging. So since I am working wet on wet, I did need to soften that up just a bit. And it, 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 very, it was very effective. And so now I'm just kind of getting in the horizon line. And this is in the areas where you do want those soft edges. You do want it to kind of blend into the background. You do not want it to be very intense back there. And uh, yeah, so there's a whole lot of uh, background that's going to be going in. And, uh, and I am keeping it pretty soft. Now I'm going to go ahead and throw up the, uh, there it is, the um, reference for you to take a look at. So you can see that sometimes the background colors are very subtle in the shift in value. Of course, it's a little bit softer um, and cooler in the background, a little bit softer and lighter in value. And um, so I'm trying to remember or remind myself that I must, must not put the detail in the background. So you can see here, I'm still working on the saguaro cactus, but I thought it was important to be able to you know, show you the reference so you can see where my mind is going with this. And you know, I'm more interested in a lot of the dark values and, um, and I'm, uh, I keep going back and forth, back and forth looking at my reference. Uh, I am taken by the saguaro cactuses. I guess I'm a little hung up on that because I can't get away from them. I just keep wanting to paint more and more on that cactus there. But you can see even the cactus that I put in the background, it's super, super soft. I actually blended it further with that 278 um, super soft brush that I like to use for blending.
okay, I'm starting to move through the piece and I'm starting to add the actual boulders and rocks and keeping, you know, I'm, I'm being very mindful of where all the dark values are and I still need to just have the form and I probably will worry a little bit more about some of the actual light in a bit, but I am just wanting to get the actual structures in. So, you know, and here I'm going back into that tree, adding a couple more woody branches into it. It's, it's, it's the what little bit of detail I'm actually gonna add to that branch. I mean, the branch or whatever this bush is in front. I'm sure it has a really great name and I wish I could impress you with my knowledge of <laughs> plant life in the desert. I'm doing well just to be able to tell you that's a saguaro cactus, trust me. But I just, you know, I, I, I'm taken by all the interesting greens, that the very sagey, very cool, brownie, and a lot of brownie greens that I just, I just love, I just absolutely love. And all the little cacti, there's so much different cactuses there. And my friend would warn me not to touch them. I know, it, it seems like that's a no brainer, right? Don't touch the cactus, but yet, I'm also the girl who likes to touch paint to make sure it's wet, even though there's a sign that says wet paint, I'm gonna touch it. So yeah, I was really good. I didn't touch any cactuses on this trip. But um, yeah, so I'm laying in the little, just the cactuses and all the different plant life. Again, see, I'm going back up to the top, softening that stuff up even more. I want it to look fuzzy. I want it to look far away. I do not want it to be sharp focused. Now I can also go in behind my bushes and enhance them by darkening some of the um, structures in the background and by cutting in behind them. That helps make whatever's in the foreground stand out a little bit more. And uh, you know, this is, this is fun. I am totally digging this piece. I am really enjoying just putting in the plant life here. Now it's time to put in some more of the foreground color that happens to be behind the big cat. So I'm adding the shadows and a lot of the dark values that go in around the cat, really any of the paint that is going to be behind the cat. I need this cat to look like it's a part of the environment and not necessarily just cut and pasted. You know, it needs to look like it's in there. So I want the back end of the cat to be a little bit less focused, if you will. And what a great shot of the back of my head. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, so I am putting in the sand and the soil and the plants and everything that's in behind the cat. So I have a wet edge to work into. So I'll have this all nice and wet all around the cat. So when I start laying and blocking in his colors, it will all kind of meld into the actual scenery.
Now to block in the cat. Now I've got a wet edge in the background to work on and I'm, I'm being very mindful of just, I'm not really doing detail, I'm just keeping it really blocky because if you are familiar with my work, I'm oftentimes uh, tweaking as I go and I will eventually say, mm, I gotta elongate the front paw or something else has to move out a little bit. So I am really studying my reference and trying to uh, make sure where, making sure like the ear is in relationship to the tail and the other ear in relationship to the shoulder and making sure all my angles and proportions are correct as I, as I move through the cat. I'm using a lot of cool browns on this one, including the color um, Purple Lake, which is a wonderful purpley brown color. I like using it. It's a very cool color and it seems to do well with the um, mountain lion coloration that I wanted to capture here. And I did want the cat to blend into her ba or his background, but I didn't want him to disappear in it either. So um, obviously a lot of color phases you can have here and this is the one I chose. I'm using a lot of burnt sienna, purple lake, yellow ochre, white, um, are all some of the colors that's going into the cat but obviously I'm working on a lot of the rocks here because I just needed the cat to be blocked in and you know knowing that I've got that mass of shadow obviously I have my light coming in from the left on this painting so I have to keep that in mind so at this point is where I'm leaving off for the day and I come back in to finish everything up um, the following day I think but this is where I am and we're getting ready to jump back in it and I I can't leave it alone of course I am having so much fun with all these different plants and what's wonderful is I actually did experience this particular spot uh, in the desert and it was funny my friend Kathy referred to this little spot as the yoga rocks because she's been out in the desert and has actually seen people doing yoga on these rocks no joke <laughs> so I had a ball just doing just the foliage and everything around uh, and obviously now the mountain lion was not in the picture but she kept my friend Kathy kept warning me you know be very mindful where you are watch where you step don't step on any rattlesnakes watch out for mountain lions and I'm thinking yikes so even though I didn't actually see a mountain lion on this trip, I did want to include one in this particular painting. And this is, gives you a little idea, looking at the reference and looking at the face, and I'm just kind of popping in uh, everything that I need. Now, I will say that this, my image is a little bit distorted because you're looking at it from the angle, so the cat's not quite as narrow as it appears in the, um, in the video because of the angle of my camera that's doing the videotaping, but you get the gist of all the colors that are going in here. So I'm starting to really stack my colors, trying to be mindful of not to include too much detail in the background and focus my detail on the places that I really want to, you know, for you to notice, and that would be the face. Now you see me laying my brush up there a minute ago and I'm checking the angles. Now, of course, using my handy dandy dagger, I'm getting ready to do some fun um, brush and foliage in the foreground here. So I'm going to start with a color that I mix that's basically like a raw sienna. I personally don't use raw sienna out of a tube. Um, I choose to make a color that looks very similar to it, which for me is a combination of yellow ochre and burnt sienna. So that's what I'm kind of laying in here now. And uh, so I'll put this color in before I go in with the really light colors. And you can see I've already put the really dark, dark colors in behind it. So I started with the dark twigs, if you will. Then I'm going in with medium tone twigs or grasses. And then eventually I will stack the lighter colors on top of that. And that makes the brush seem like it has more volume. It's thicker. You can kind of, it's dense. You can look into it. And that's... That's the little bit of cover, if you will, that I gave this cat. <laughs> I generally don't want my uh, subjects of any piece to seem vulnerable in a, in a piece of art. And so I almost always will give an animal an out, if you will, or some type of cover or, or, or something to make them feel secure. And that's why I almost always put some bushes or brush or something like that into it, even though that wasn't in the actual original photo reference that I worked from to do this. So yes, I'm, I'm finishing 
um, with the lightest colors last. And that's what you see me going in here. And again, using my handy dandy dagger brush because I just love those things. They are great for so many things. Yes, they are great for whiskers, they're great for long hair, and they're also great for long grass too. And here, folks, is the finished piece. And I really did enjoy this piece, and I hope you did too. If you have any questions whatsoever, please leave them in the comment section and I'll get to you. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have, and perhaps you have a suggestion for the next video. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I enjoyed the painting very much. I loved being able to put the cat in. I, uh, when my friend and I were out on our, white, our walk here in the desert, she kept telling me, you know, be mindful of where you're walking, don't step on any rattlesnakes, and watch for mountain lions. And so, of course, I'm like, what? <laughs> I've got to watch? So, even though we didn't see any rattlesnakes or mountain lions, I did want to put this animal in the painting and therefore, you know, I wanted him coming down and I was able to keep the composition of the piece kind of flowing in that direction. So it was fun, right? So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give me a thumbs up. And if you really did, please subscribe to my channel. And from Kingsport, Tennessee, until next time, I'll see ya. Bye.